This material is a part of the Oklahoma Historical Society's Oral History Program, Living Legends Collection. This material was originally recorded on May 23, 1968. It is the 75th anniversary observance of the Oklahoma Historical Society. This material was recorded by Mr. Raymond Fields. This uh, material is being re-recorded on April the 18th, 1985, <clears throat> for inclusion in the permanent collections of the Oral History Program by Judith Michener. We have present here Mr. George H. Schur, President of the Oklahoma Historical Society, former mayor of Oklahoma City, and an author in his own right, who will tell the purposes of this dedication. Mr. Schur. Thank you, Mr. Fields. This is a, a very important day in the history of our society, the Oklahoma Historical Society. The society was organized May the 27th, 1893 at Kingfisher at a convention of the Oklahoma Press Association. Its original purpose as organized by the Press Association uh, was to preserve all of the newspapers being published in Oklahoma Territory and in Indian Territory. Since then, uh, we have grown and now encompass all of the aspects of uh, the preservation of the heritage of Oklahoma. Uh, we uh, are now a state institution uh, whose funds are provided by the legislature with appropriations. The ceremony today uh, was under the general supervision of a 75th anniversary committee of uh, which Mr. Stanley Draper of Oklahoma City was the chairman. Uh, sponsoring uh, the event with his committee was the Oklahoma Press Association of which Mr. Milo Watson is president and uh, the Oklahoma Memorial Association of which Mr. Joe McBride is president. We have just concluded our opening ceremony. The opening ceremony consisted of the, uh, an, an invocation in front of the building by the flagpole by uh, Dean uh, John Van Dyke, Dean of St. Uh, uh, Paul's Episcopal Cathedral, uh, the presentation of the colors and raising the flag, a pledge of allegiance to the United States, led by the vice chairman of our committee, Mr. Jimmy Stewart, uh, a tender of our services to the state of Oklahoma for the next 75 years, the acceptance of those services by Mr. Robert Breeden, Executive Director of the Industrial Development and Parks Commission, representing Governor Bartlett. And following that, a formal opening of our building at 1 o'clock sharp by Mr. Draper, as Chairman of our committee, assisted by Mr. Milo Watson, as I said, President of the Press Association, uh, Mr. Joe McBride, President of the Memorial Association, and uh, by Mr. Breeden, representing the state of Oklahoma. The building is rapidly filling. I'm sure you can hear all this background uh, uh, commotion. We hope to have at least a thousand people here. Uh, I would, our officers are all here with us. The, our first vice president is Mr. Milt Phillips, who's right here in the room with me. Our second vice president is Mr. Fisher Mulgrew. Our treasurer is Mrs. George Bowman. I, there will be all manner of people, I hope, uh, saying a few words uh, this afternoon. I can uh, see around me many, many friends of the society. I see Earl Simon standing here, uh, just all kinds of folks. Uh, the uh, Press Association, all of its members, editors, and the publishers are here by the dozens. They each have their own uh, identification badges. And uh, Mr. A. Mill, would like to get uh, Mr. Milt Phillips next. Uh, the Oklahoma Memorial Association are here, its officers and directors, and they have their own identification badges. Our staff, and we now have some 18 or 19 uh, full-time uh, members of our staff, in addition to Mr. Fraker, all have their own badges. Mr. Uh, Stanley Draper's committee and those assisting him uh, have their own badges. Up on four, the fourth floor of the building, uh, my sister Lucille Shirk is chairman of the committee that is providing the refreshments. They have the punch bowl from the USS Oklahoma uh, out and it's full of punch and the 75th anniversary birthday cake. Uh, red, of course, with the great seal of Oklahoma on it. We'll have to cut it uh, shortly. Uh, standing here with me is uh, Milk Phillips uh, from Seminole, our first vice president. 
Milt is particularly an important officer in our society because he is a former president of the Oklahoma Press Association and so continues that close link that has been between our two societies ever since the day we were organized uh, as an adjunct of the Oklahoma Press Association. We returned yesterday from a three-day uh, historical tour. We had some 80 tourists and two buses uh, touring the eastern part of the state. Mr. Phillips was with me, Mr. Moldo was along, of course, and several other board members. Uh, I would like now to turn uh, the, the microphone over to, to Milt, and uh, uh, we're grateful that uh, Oklahoma Christian College felt this event of significance adequate to uh, become a part of the Living Legend Library. Just talk at it. I'm real happy today, Ray, to be uh, here because as a member of the Oklahoma Press Association, I am extremely proud of the Oklahoma Historical Society. As a member of the Press Association, I feel one of the things over the years that will live uh, as a tribute to the association is this historical society and the work it does. As a native Oklahoman born down here on the South Canadian River between Mustang and Moore, I take a great deal of pride in the historical society itself, as I know you do as a native Oklahoman take a great deal of pride in what this historical society is doing. Today, as we honor this 75th anniversary, and the parent, the Oklahoma Press Association, comes back as city groups of Oklahoma, as, the, uh, as you and the uh, uh, folks who are preparing this fine heritage uh, series come over and view some of the results of 75 years and see here some of the things which depicts the hope of the next 75 years, I feel that this will be a milestone for the Oklahoma Press Association. And I am particularly happy and proud that the uh, microfilming of these precious files of newspapers which have recorded the history of Oklahoma, that these precious files are now coming on microfilm, and one of these days we'll have the more than 30 million pages of this history as recorded in the newspapers of the state on microfilm, indestructible and available to future generations. Thanks, Ray. Now, would you introduce the incoming president of the Oklahoma Press Association? Merle Lansden. Uh, Merle, Merle Lansden, you ought to come over here as uh, the incoming president of the Oklahoma Press Association. Merle, come over here. We, 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 we want a few words of Willis. Well, uh, uh, come over here and let us present you. Now, we've been bragging here uh, about the uh, past 75 years of the Press Association and what uh, this society may have done to deserve the confidence and the foresightedness uh, of the Oklahoma Press Association. Now, Willis Lansden, as its president, as we start our 76th year, uh, we'd like for you probably to sit down here with Ray and uh, uh, yes. tell him what you hope we might be doing in the years ahead. During this next year, of course, while well, we hope to reactivate or, or keep, keep in circulation our, our affiliation with the historical society and to um, do all we can to promote it and, and we have a deep interest in it and our interest will continue I know and all of our future I'm sure will be working with uh, Milt and, and his project that he's worked on with the uh, files of our old papers and current copies and things, and there's a lot of interest in the Historical Society through the newspaper book home, and I'm sure it will continue through the years. Morrow, you being the, uh, I mean, Willis, you being the um, publisher of the paper at Beaver, I know are intimately 
acquainted with the history of the Oklahoma panhandle and no man's land. Isn't it a fact that at one period of history that uh, the panhandle aspired to be a separate state by the name of Beaver, with Beaver City as its capital? Uh, that's right. At, at one time, um, uh, it was organized as Cimarron Territory, and they sent a representative to Washington, D.C. at that time, but, but they just never would uh, recognize. Of course, this Cimarron Territory was only short-lived, and believe it was only about a year. And then the Organic Act of 1890 uh, uh, created the uh, present system now. I'm Ben Blackstock, Secretary Manager of the Oklahoma Press Association, uh, which uh, job I've been in since uh, January 1, 1953. We've uh, warmly lent our support to the Oklahoma Historical Society. I think it's interesting that uh, the uh, Indian Territory Press Association was founded in uh, Muskogee in 1888, and its purpose in the organization was paternal and uh, at its organization to provide for its members a chance to get together and have a good time. On the other hand, the uh, Oklahoma Territorial Editors uh, met in Kingfisher and organized the Oklahoma Territorial Press Association, but their purpose was completely different, that of preserving the history of Oklahoma and um, establishing the Oklahoma Historical Society. Thank you, Raymond. Now we will hear from Mr. Stanley Draper, one of our most prominent citizens of Oklahoma, who is the chairman of this occasion today. For many years, Mr. Draper was the secretary manager of the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce and presently is its chairman of the board. He has just returned with a group of Oklahomans from a trip to the Orient. I don't know whether he would want to comment on that or not, but I now introduce you to Mr. Stanley Draper. Mr. Fields, we... Uh... Oh, no. Mr. Fields, uh, I appreciate this opportunity of saying a word. Um, it looks like we're going to be a very successful affair this afternoon. We commend uh, Mayor Shirk and... Uh, his associates and predecessors on keeping such a fine record of the uh, romantic history of Oklahoma. Those who cannot attend uh, this prayer this afternoon should visit the Oklahoma Historical Society. The first opportunity to be thrilled with what you see here. Thank you. It is a real uh, pleasure to represent the uh, parent organization of the Oklahoma Historical Society on this 75th anniversary. As president of the Press Association, we uh, have always been prideful of, that our people have been uh, associated uh, with it down through the years. Uh, at the present time, uh, the vice president, Mel Phillips, is the publisher of the Seminole Producer. Looking down over the list of directors, I see quite a number of Oklahoma newspapermen who are giving of their time and their talents in serving as director, uh, including uh, Lou Allard from Drumright, um, Joe McBride from uh, Anadarko and uh, Oklahoma City, R.G. Miller, the famous uh, smoking room editor from the Daily Oklahoman, Merle Woods from El Reno, all these and many others have uh, a history of giving much time to the Oklahoma Historical Society. The interest which they show is representative of the feeling among the newspaper people of this state in perpetuating and helping to, to move the historical society ahead and make it a forceful institution in our state. You have been listening to Milo Warner Watson, the um, publisher of the Perry Daily Journal and currently the president of the Oklahoma Historical Society, who, which has given all of its efforts toward creation of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Now I want to introduce you to one of the directors and foremost leaders of the Oklahoma Historical Society, 
Mr. Joel McBride, who is publisher of the Anadarko Daily News. Mr. McBride. Thank you, Mr. Fields. <clears throat> this is a great day for the Oklahoma Historical Society, and it's one thing that all the newspaper men of the state of Oklahoma can work with and promote without stepping on one another's toes, because in this instance, uh, there are no politics to be considered or economic games. And it leads to the newspapers, mostly the problem of conserving the history of Oklahoma. Every day we live is another part in history. You'd be surprised the number of newspaper files that we have here in the Historical Society. One can look back and see just about everything they want to see about what has gone on in Oklahoma for 75 years. The newspapers of Oklahoma have been very liberal by giving their newspapers to the society in order to make this history legible and available. Thank you, Mr. McBride. Now I want to introduce to you Mrs. Nola Rigdon, who takes as avid an interest in Oklahoma history as any person of whom I know. Mrs. Rigdon lives at Crescent. She makes constant historical tours to distant places, including the Oklahoma Panhandle. Mrs. Rigdon, will you say something? Uh, is your age a secret? No, no, my age is not a secret. I, have, I am 78, uh, soon to be 79. I keep my age in Oklahoma pretty close together. They just beat me by the 22nd of April, 22nd of November. But we, we, we ought to think of the past, but we've also got to look to the future and work for the future of this state. Uh, I have been traveling three days now with our State Historical Society, and it, we have got to wake up to the heritage that we have here in this state before it is too late. Thank you, Mrs. Rigdon, and I hope you're around for the centennial observation when this will be played back. Now we will have an interview with one of the nation's leading merchants, a man who started his business in Oklahoma in a meager way and is now a nationally known merchant, Mr. C.R. Anthony, who has taken great pride in the growth of his state of Oklahoma. Mr. Anthony. Thank you, Mr. Fields, and I'm very happy and proud to be a resident of Oklahoma and have played a part in its uh, history. We're most happy. This is a very happy day for me to be here celebrating our 75th anniversary. It just so happens I haven't been here quite 75, but I've been here over 70 years in Oklahoma. It's our home state, and uh, we're proud of it, and there's a great future for Oklahoma. Thank you, Mr. C.R. Anthony. <laughs> now we will have an interview with Mr. D. Joel Ferguson, the publisher of the newspaper at Pawnee. Mr. Ferguson was born in the Pawnee Indian Territory, and he may want to tell something about the history of the Indian tribe. Also, he is the uh, publisher of the second continuous, oldest continuous paper in Oklahoma Territory. Mr. Ferguson. Thank you. The, um, as a child, I remember many of the older Pawnees uh, spending their days on the courtyard and uh, under the shade trees, wrapped in blankets and maybe wearing only uh, Long underwear, a uh, big hat. This was uh, their transition into the modern man's dress. Of course, this is not true today, and uh, it's hard to tell them apart. The, because of the heritage of the area with, from the Indians, we, when we established our newspaper and bought out uh, 
or other, the others, we call it the chief. And we try, we have tried all along to uh, carry the Indian news along with uh, other news, but we do keep it separate, and they enjoy this, and, and seem like other people do too. But they're pretty well integrated into our society, and. Um, we, history has become such a part of us that it's hard to recognize as such. I don't know what else to uh, tell you. Thank you very much, Joe. <clears throat> and now we will hear some remarks by a leader, a political leader in Oklahoma, with whom you are well acquainted, Senator Denzel Garrison of Bartlesville, the Republican minority leader in the Oklahoma State Senate. Mr. Garrison. Thank you, Raymond. Well, this is rather an unexpected pleasure. I'm happy to record my thoughts about the history of Oklahoma for the Living Library. I come from Oklahoma stock on both sides of my family. My grandfather's on either side of the family made the run into northern Oklahoma from Kansas. One of my grandfathers settled at Cherokee, Oklahoma in Alfalfa County after the run. The other, John Smith, settled in Woods County at Alva. So early in the history of this state, the Garrison family and the Smith family came to Oklahoma and we've been in Oklahoma ever since. We have a very precious heritage in the heritage of the run in Oklahoma, and so far as I know, no other state can point to anything uh, similar to the run relative to the settlement of territory. I think this in itself, of course, will set us uh, up well in history as having our own peculiar heritage and our own heritage of which we can all be proud. Then another heritage of Oklahoma which has uh, certainly stood Oklahoma in good stead is the military heritage of this state. And I speak of the many Oklahomans who served in World War I with Oklahoma units, my father, by the way, being one of them, and on down through World War II where the 45th Infantry Division became one of the most famous American fighting units of all times. It may be interesting to you to know that considering the World War II service and the Korean War service, the 45th Infantry Division had more combat days on frontline combat duty than any other emergency unit. In other words, any other National Guard or Reserve unit and considerable more than most regular army units. Certain regular army divisions probably logged more combat time by the end of the Korean War than the 45th, but no other emergency unit did so. And of course, the glorious Thunderbird heritage of Oklahoma is something of which we can all be proud. And I'm quite certain that the youngsters I see here on uh, this great day are going to grow up and write their names also on the pages of history just as their Thunderbird fathers and older brothers did, Raymond. Thank you, Senator Garrison. I might call your attention that uh, one of the directors of the Living Legend Library is a citizen of your town, Mr. W.W. W. Keeler. Uh, okay, thank you. And now we will hear from another member of the Oklahoma Senate who is prominent in the news of the day, a native-born Oklahoman, born in Greer County, Senator Jack Short, who represents an Oklahoma County District in the State Senate. Mr. Short. Thank you, Mr. Field. I doubt that I'll be quite as articulate as Senator Garrison was about Oklahoma history, in that Senator Garrison has made the study of genealogy a very strong avocation of his. I was born in Greer County, Oklahoma, and have lived the biggest part of my life in the state. Oklahoma does have a rich and unique history. It's a state only 60-some-odd years of age right now, 
but in that time it has made a tremendous imprint upon this nation. The blending of the Indian Territory and the Oklahoma Territory into the Constitutional Convention back in 1906 and on up to the present day has written a very colorful page in the nation's history. I will keep my remarks somewhat brief. I see the governor of Oklahoma has just entered the room, and I know, Mr. Field, you want some remarks from him. It's been a pleasure to say these few things. And now it is a distinct pleasure to present to you the First Lady of Oklahoma, Mrs. Dewey Bartlett. Mrs. Bartlett. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Field. It's lovely to be here today. And Dewey when, and I were very pleased when we walked up to the building to see so many people who were interested in coming here on this very special day. I think that, uh, of course, the job that the Historical Society is doing in uh, presenting to all the citizens of Oklahoma uh, the fascinating parts about the history of our state is uh, appreciated by so many of us, and Dewey and I, who are practically your next-door neighbors, um, are always interested in coming here and very glad to be here today. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bartle. It is a privilege at this time for the Living Legend Library to record for posterity some remarks by the first, by the governor of Oklahoma, Governor Dewey Bartlett. Mr. Field, thank you very much. It's wonderful for me to have this opportunity to mention to the people of the state the importance of the many historical sites and uh, things that are of great interest to history that are on display throughout the entire state. Uh, certainly, uh, here at the state capitol, there are many things that uh, anyone interested in the background and heritage of Oklahoma would like to see and uh, observe and learn more about. Our state has had a tremendous history and one which gives it the impetus to move ahead into uh, broader horizons in the future, a greater economy and a greater participation in the things going on throughout the world. I've been particularly pleased to take a number of trips throughout the state, uh, seeing the more of the heritage of Oklahoma, more of the historical significance of Oklahoma, and I invite you to do the same. Our tourism industry is growing every day, and I was pleased recently to receive some reports that indicate that last year was uh, a significant increase over the normal increases we've enjoyed in previous years. We're hoping to put more emphasis on this. A big part of the attraction to tourists in Oklahoma are the many points of historical interest throughout the state. And these are be, being brought more to the attention of the people. Uh, we're adding 50-some billboards this year to bring to the attention of people traveling to Hemisphere 68 and traveling through our state the attractions that we have. Many of these are just off of well-traveled four-lane roads and within easy reach of the driver. Also, I encourage Oklahomans on weekends and when they have the opportunity of uh, driving uh, in the state uh, to uh, take various tours that are available to see the beauty of the state, the many attractions that we have, the many things to do. And I believe that you'll find that the opportunities for recreation, for enjoyment, for increasing your historical knowledge are greater in Oklahoma than anywhere else. Mr. Fields, I'll turn it back to you, and it's a real pleasure to be with you today. I would like to recall Governor Bartlett for some additional comment on the 75th anniversary of Oklahoma. Governor Bartlett. Uh, it's a pleasure, of course, to participate in the 75th anniversary and uh, to mention the uh, Oklahoma State Historical Society's uh, large involvement in the growth of the state by bringing attention of all of us to the uh, history that Oklahoma has enjoyed. 
One of the things that we were doing at the mansion, this is a plan and program of my wife's and is to uh, make the mansion more attractive to the many people who visit it. We started some time ago by acquiring art uh, and art objects which uh, are produced by Oklahoma artists and we have some 28 artists with their work on display in the mansion at the present time. In addition to this, we have been in touch with the former governors and it recently at a dinner at the mansion, which I think perhaps is the first dinner of that many governors in the mansion. It was agreed then that each one of them would donate a significant uh, belonging of theirs to the mansion and this undoubtedly will become property of the uh, State Historical Society and be uh, of, uh, on permanent display in the mansion so that people visiting it will be able to see some of the uh, personal belongings of the former governors and see and uh, right before them a part of the history of the mansion. The mansion, of course, is very interesting and we think it is a very beautiful building, very livable and very well decorated at the present time. We're also going to contact the families of former governors to do likewise to make contributions of things of theirs that they had in the mansion. We think that this will make the mansion a real historical interest to all the citizens of the state. We're hoping that this It was agreed then that each one of them would donate a significant uh, belonging of theirs to the mansion and this undoubtedly will become property of the uh, State Historical Society and be uh, of, uh, on permanent display in the mansion so that people visiting it will be able to see some of the uh, personal belongings of the former governors and see and uh, right before them a part of the history of the mansion. The mansion, of course, is very interesting, and we think it is a very beautiful building, very livable, and very well decorated at the present time. We're also going to contact the families of former governors to do likewise to make contributions of things of theirs that they had in the mansion. We think that this will make the mansion a real historical interest to all the citizens of the state. We're hoping that this can be accomplished within several months so that very soon we'll be able to open the doors and have people from Oklahoma see a lot of the heritage and a lot of the personal history of the chief executives of the state of Oklahoma. Thank you again, Governor Bartlett. And now we will have some remarks from the director of the Oklahoma Historical Society, Mr. Elmer Fraker. Mr. Fraker has been the chief administrative office officer of this uh, Oklahoma Historical Society since 1955. He knows its inside workings. He knows every nook and corner. Mr. Fraker. Thank you, Mr. Fields. It is quite an opportunity tell something about the Oklahoma Historical Society and its growth, particularly growth in the last 10 or 12 years. It had many years of growth for that matter from its beginning and some wonderfully devoted volunteer people who helped build up great collections, particularly the newspapers of this state. And this came about, of course, has been mentioned before because it was newspaper men who founded the Oklahoma Historical Society. But I do not want to dwell so much on its history. I do would want to say some things about its growth. Within the last uh, quarter of a century, historical society work has become highly professionalized. And sometimes it's most difficult to get staff members who are well trained in the particular field where they work. This is true of curators in museums, archivists in the archives, and of course librarians who are particularly trained for historical society work. And then there is the field of endeavor for historic sites, 
And that means that your historical society, particularly the Oklahoma Historical Society, not only has its office in Oklahoma City, but it has its uh, work in almost every county in the state. I think that Oklahoma's history is like the history of every other state, yet unlike, in that it is unique. Many things have been pointed out by Oklahoma's history, but I think its main divisions are very interesting. Of course, historically, the first part of Oklahoma's story was that of the five Indian nations who were forcibly removed and brought to uh, what is now eastern Oklahoma. They came over what we call a trail of tears because so many of them did not make it because of inadequate transportation, inadequate medical supplies, and other things that had been promised them by the federal government in moving to the West. But they did come to the West and they reestablished their nations, the Cherokees and the Choctaws and the Creeks, the Seminoles and the Chickasaws. And the uniqueness of this arises from the fact that here were native Indian nations. Now, these Indian peoples had their own governments, they had their legislative bodies, their judiciary, and their executives. And they carried on their governments the same as a state, but more like a nation. Therefore, they were called the five civilized nations because early in pre-colonial times, they had been a highly civilized people, and then they had adopted the white man's way during the colonial times and expansion of the Spanish and the French, and particularly the English. They were really Indian in blood, but uh, they were white in their civilization. These people had many mixed bloods because and many white people had married into the Indian families while they dwelt in the southeastern section of the United States. Coming to Oklahoma and reestablishing their nations, they got a radio of savvy and know-how, we might say, in the matters of government. And they continued these programs until the time of the Civil War. And most of these Indians took the side of the South or the Confederacy in the war. And the country was overrun eventually uh, by the Union forces, but there was a Confederate uh, general by the name of Stan Wade, who was a Cherokee, who never allowed the Union forces to get south of the Canadian River, thereby spared Texas of any invasion from the north. These Indian tribes fought to the last. Now, there was a segment of Cherokees and Creeks who remained with the Union. But these people went through a terrible ordeal as they had, had previously in a generation when they moved to the West. After it was over with, of course, they had to be restored the same as the other states of the South. But the thing that is so unique is that these people got a great deal of training in running their own governments with the three departments of government that have been mentioned. So these people are the early part of Oklahoma's history. Far to the west of them are lands that they were never able, although they'd been allotted to them, to operate and maintain for the simple reason they lacked the resources and they lacked the population. The result was a great stretch of country west of the Cherry Keys, extended south of the Kansas border. South of that was lands held by the Creeks and the Seminoles, clear, you might say, to the Rocky Mountains. Those are the Grants. And then, of course, to the south of that was the lands of the Chickasaws, out to the uh, 98th Meridian. Well, these lands uh, further west in this line that I have described was a vast open range country. Across it came the Chisholm Trail eventually. Comanches and Kiowas roamed over it. There were nomadic people, but it was the most wonderful agricultural land in the whole central region of the United States. And a great clamor was set up by former veterans of both the Union and Confederate armies for the opening of these lands to white settlement. They said the Indians are not occupying them. They may own title to them, but they're not using them. And therefore, let the white population in. This pressure was brought on Congress to such an extent that eventually, which was in 1889, the first opening was made. It has been previously mentioned, one of the glamorous events of Amer world history, not only American history, but world history, took place in the great run of 1889. This was followed by runs into the Cheyenne Arapaho country, the, the Potawatomi country, and then eventually the greatest run of them all in the Cherokee Strip. Now, these runs, of course, were the based on the idea that one that got to a piece of land first, whether it was a town lot or 160 acres of farmland, one that got there first, drove a stake into the ground, laid claim to it, that belongs to them. Nowhere else in the world has land been settled that way. It was a great pell-mell thing, but these people that rushed into these lands in western Oklahoma 
were mostly highly civilized people in that they were good religious people, not a bunch of outlaws, so often been pictured, but they were the sons and daughters of farmer families further east, wanting a new home for themselves. And thus, western Oklahoma, along with land lottery, lotteries and drawings of the Kiowa Comanche lands and also the big pasture, when those lands were all put together, they made what is now western Oklahoma. Of course, the Panhandle country came in, uh, which was a very unique thing in itself, and I use that word advisedly over and over because Oklahoma's history is unique. The great Panhandle of Oklahoma came in because of the Missouri Compromise, which forbade slavery north of 3630. Texas, being a slave state, did not want that land. Kansas could do nothing with it. And so they attached it to Oklahoma Territory when the western part of Oklahoma was given territorial status. Now remember, the Indian nations were continuing through all these years in their operations. And then there came the clamor for statehood. And the clamor of statehood was statehood for the eastern part, and so they had a constitutional convention held in Muskogee to establish the state of Sequoia. But it did not uh, bear fruitation. And then they called the constitutional convention of both territories to meet in Guthrie, which was the territorial capital of Oklahoma Territory, and their constitution was drawn, and the state of Oklahoma was created, and it entered the Union on November the 16th in 1907, the Union of this land that had been opened by the Big Runs and the Indian nations to the east. Now, these are the two segments of Oklahoma history that I have mentioned. First, were the Indian nations, and second, the big horse races, as we call them. Those were the two distinguishing things up to that time of Oklahoma history. In the meantime, something had been happening in northeastern Oklahoma, which was to change the whole complex of Oklahoma and to change it eventually from a rural state and one that had a rural attitude to one of industrialization and to one of great wealth. And that, of course, was the discovery of oil in Bartles Bill and in that area and its expansion to almost every county in the state to where at the time of World War I, Oklahoma was the greatest oil-producing region in the world. And to where one of the British naval officers said, we floated to victory on a sea of oil, and that oil was coming from Oklahoma. And so these were three great segments of Oklahoma history, the Indian nations, the great horse races, and the development of oil. And the development of oil made Oklahoma a tremendously wealthy state, a state with a surplus, and thereby, either through taxation or by gifts of men who had created wealth in the oil fields, Great institutions have been developed, universities, great churches, great hospitals, all those things have made Oklahoma a most complex and metropolitan state. And so we consider these the three great facets of Oklahoma's history up to this time. As a historical society, it's been our job to record these and to make a record of them. And now we are ready to make a record of the fourth, whatever it may be, facet of Oklahoma history. It is a, an intriguing history and uh, it's a joy to all of us that work in it because we have the feeling that no one knows who he is unless he knows where his people came from and what they have done because it's a yesterday's civilization and today's civilization that determines the civilization of tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Fields. Thank you, Mr. Franker, for that most enlightening and interesting talk. And the board of the Living Legend Library is very much interested in having further recordings from the Oklahoma Historical Society. And now we will have some remarks of the Living Legend Library from a man whose entire life has been entwined in the history of Oklahoma. He is presently second vice president of the Oklahoma Historical Society. He has served in our state senate and has taken a prominent part in all of the civic, political, and religious fraternal activities of Oklahoma. Mr. Fisher Muldo of Norman. Mr. Muldo. You're very kind, my old friend, but I want to decline the fact that I was ever in the state senate. My young brother, Hal Muldo, the late commanding officer in of the 45th Division, General Muldo of Norman, was in the state senate. I have never held public office. However, which, uh, to keep the record straight, I made that statement. Now, uh, officially and personally, I am delighted for this crowd that's here today to visit you and to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Old Honor Historical Society. We have just returned, I was a member of the party of 80 odd, that made a tour of the state, and the eastern side of the state, the Old Indian Territory side. 
we had and we saw some wonderful things. I was uh, completely amazed, even though I, I was worried in that section of the state, to see the improvement made in the historical sites, uh, places that will become uh, legends in Oklahoma, and that have contributed so much from in the 1830s up until the present time. I, we have a beautiful day in Oklahoma City. The crowd is interested and is enthusiastic, and I'm awfully happy that they're here. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Muldrow, and I regret making the error of placing you in the state senate <laughs> instead of your brother. Thank you again. <clears throat> We now have with us the treasurer of the Oklahoma Press Association, Mr. H. Merle Woods of El Reno. And we would like to get some facts and figures about the growth and extent of uh, the Oklahoma Press Association operations. And I requested Mr. Woods to relate some of these facts. Merle? Thank you, Raymond. My first uh, press experience was in 1912, 1907, when I was a printer's devil at the old town of Welch, Oklahoma. Uh, I first became a friend of the Press Association in 1916. I attended the first meet, my first meeting of the association at Tulsa. Then, uh, at that time, Mr. Bronson was secretary treasurer of the association, and I, in the following year I went to work for him. I knew him until his death in 1924. Uh, through working with him, I found much, uh, much about the operation of the Oakland Press Association, I met many of the old-time editors, and uh, received a huge respect for the press of Oklahoma. In fact, uh, I think it's something we, should, we could all brag about. From the old-time days, it was... Uh, it has changed tremendously. The old days when a Washington hand press or an army press and a hat full of type could be purchased for $100 and you were in the newspaper business to the present time when uh, several hundred thousand dollars re capital required to start a, a, a newspaper. So in the, those years, the, the Press Association has carried a prominent part. Uh, I remember when I was working with Mr. Bronson, uh, the members would pay one, two, and maybe some of them five dollars a year membership fees. Uh, now, the minimum is uh, 25, and from there on up. The press association in those days had a budget of about from four to five hundred dollars. Now that was back in uh, around 1915. Present day, uh, the Oakland Press Association budget uh, uh, runs up around two hundred fifty thousand dollars. We recently, uh, several years ago, completed our beautiful new building on North Lincoln, thirty-six hundred and one North Lincoln Boulevard. That building cost two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. We own it. It's pay it was paid off last year, and we're very proud of it. Uh, our, the Press Association now does a business. Uh, annual business of around $750,000. Uh, that means we sell advertising and have other operations which bring in revenue. So that uh, as treasurer, uh, it's a pleasure to see that much money passing through our hands. And we're hoping, naturally, that it will continue to grow. Uh, since we've finished paying for the building, We've uh, transferred of, uh, much of our financial operations to improvement of the press through uh, more meetings, through training uh, employees uh, for newspapers, and through doing research work for the newspapers. Uh, the newspaper business in a, is in a tremendous change right now. Most of the papers are, uh, well, in a few years, be. Uh, changed over from the old letterpress type of printing to offset printing. At present, uh, uh, about a third of the dailies of the, of the state have, are printed by offset, and the others, as their old presses wear out, are changing over to this new type of uh, photo mechanical 
operation of uh, preparing their newspapers. So while the newspapers are undergoing this great change, the Press Association has a big duty to perform in uh, helping with the research on what is the best methods, the best uh, machinery, and the, uh, the training of the employees for operating this new form of printing. We are very proud of our press association. We uh, think that it is performing a, a wonderful duty for the state. We, th we think that uh, Oklahoma's progress has been much enhanced by the fact that we've had an unusually powerful press over the years. And uh, as treasurer, it does me uh, good to see this great change occurring. I'm happy to have this opportunity to uh, to speak on this splendid uh, program which Raymond Fields is uh, doing such a good job at. And uh, I, I hope that in years to come that the uh, Press Association will continue to bear the prestige that it has in, in, in the past. Thank you. We have the good fortune to have in the Living Legend Library set up here today a former Chief Executive of the State of Oklahoma, former Governor William Holloway. Governor Holloway has been closely identified with the history of Oklahoma for many decades. He comes from southeastern Oklahoma, and one of his very close friends and protégés, I might say, was Dr. Henry Bennett who was president of Oklahoma Agricultural and Mechanical College before it became Oklahoma State University. Dr. Bennett and Mrs. Bennett were killed in a plane accident in Asia. And now I would like to turn the microphone over to Governor Holloway for his reminiscent interview. I can leave that alone. Yeah. Mr. President, and friends. <clears throat> I appreciate very much the words of introduction of my warm friend of many years. I presume we've been friends for 35 or 40 years. That's correct. Also, <clears throat> the president of our association, Mr. Joe McBride, is here. I'm particularly interested in this occasion because uh, my time goes back a good many years now. I was a governor at the time the legislature made the appropriation to build this building. I naturally had quite little to do with getting the legislation through and passed, and I had the honor and the privilege of signing the legislation. There are a number of people who ought to be mentioned in connection with who's entitled to the privilege of credit for the building of this splendid structure. I would say that the Honorable William Durant of Durant was probably the man who did really most of the spade work in getting it done. Do you remember about that? Very much so. That's correct, I think. He lived at Durant, but he was an employee of the state capitol. And as a governor, I persuaded the school land commission to give him ample time from his regular state position to work among the legislature and other friends to get them lined up to vote for this legislation. And I, I personally have thought about it many times. And I like to give Bill Durant a lot of credit. I don't know that it's fair to say he's entitled to most of the credit, but he's certainly entitled to a lot of it. And I know of no one entitled to more credit than he was. This is an important day in the history of Oklahoma, and I want to compliment those who have charge of affairs here today to do what 
whatever they can to help preserve the, the great history of Oklahoma. And uh, they're doing a good job. And I'm glad to be here and participate in the occasion. These things uh, take a lot of time and effort. Those of you who are not familiar with the workings of these affairs do not realize how much time and credit, how much time and effort is needed to arrange the events, get the proper people present and lined up to say what they know about the occasion. It may be in future years that somebody's information that was given today will be the only way that we have of knowing much about that particular time. So I want to thank our friends here today for giving me this privilege of saying a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor Holloway. We would like to make an 80-minute recording of your experiences and reminiscences, but time forbids us to do that today. But we do appreciate your presence, and the Oklahoma Press Association, the Oklahoma Historical Society, are deeply indebted to you for the work you did in creating this fine institution here in Oklahoma City, the Capitol Complex. Thank you again. We have a guest with us now who will contribute to the Living Legend Library in the person of the former governor of Oklahoma who is most widely known throughout the state for his activities not only in politics, but in the cattle business and many varied industries. It's a pleasure for me to introduce at this time Governor Roy Turner. Thank you, Raymond. How long do you want this to be? Just as long as you'll make it. I don't know what tape on there. <laughs> well, if I start so far back, uh, uh, as far back as Coronado in 1541, <laughs> and try to record Oklahoma history. Uh, Raymond, I've lived in it since 1894. My parents homesteaded in Lincoln County, and where they homesteaded in 1891. And of course, that was the second fox country. That was the second fox country. I interviewed Mrs. Uh, Gilstrap. She made yes, that from Chandler. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, well, my parents homesteaded about 12 miles from my Chandler. Father held a horse's bridle and wouldn't let her get a fair start. But she got a homestead. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of water's gone over the dam since that time. I can recall I was 13 years old when Oklahoma became a state. I, uh, I remember that very well, and uh, uh, some of the people didn't uh, like the way it came in because it had to come in 25 years without uh, a prohibition, and others agreed with it, but uh, because of Indian Territory, that was the way Congress set it up. Uh, I remember when Governor Haskell was elected. I can remember that election real well and the others down through the years. I can remember when Gall Governor Holloway, who was just here, just ahead of me, and sits out in front of me now, was governor here, and, and uh, the thing that he accomplished. We've grown to be, we've grown up. Oklahoma's grown up. We had some rough times, trying times. But we've grown up and we're progressing right along with the rest of the, the uh, nation and, and there are great things ahead for us, as I see it. We uh, go through change right along. 
Uh, and that, as, as the world changes, and uh, I think we're keeping up with it pretty well. Oklahoma's been very good to me. I had, had uh, they've honored me, which I, to the extent I never expected. I, I had no political ambitions. I just drifted into it. And uh, I appreciate the very fine support I got from the people in the legislature when I was in office and had some, had the responsibilities of, of, of leadership there. It was a post-war time. Our economy was different. We had so much to do to change into the uh, things that, and, 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 and the, to the extent we had to uh, make changes. But the people cooperated with me, and so did the legislature, and we were able to make some, some get to do some things that need to be done, but no governor ever gets all of the things done that he knows uh, should be done. I, uh, of course, think Oklahoma is the greatest state in the Union. I, if, you, if you'd uh, uh, have any questions that you... Well, uh, <coughs> I think it would be uh, your interest in the cattle industry is, has been outstanding, and actually you founded Hereford Heaven, did you not? Well, I, I founded a herd there that we later called the area Hereford Heaven. Uh, we, my ranch was just known as Turner Ranch. And uh, for 30 years, I bred purebred Herefords there and established a real fine herd. In 1963, I sold it to Winthrop Rockefeller. I needed to reduce my activity some. I had uh, other things, and I still do. But I needed to reduce my activities, and I decided to get out of the purebred business. That uh, I was running a thousand purebred cows there, and that's quite an operation to do that. And uh, so I decided to get out of the purebred business, and I didn't intend to sell the land. It was fine ranch, and it was our home. But the Hereford people kept after me until they got me to put a price on it, and they found one the frog fellow to buy it. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm glad, as I think back on it, we missed the home, and Ms. Turner dreams about it about every night. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of consolation in knowing that the herd is going on just like I left it, and uh, they're, they're making, uh, keeping it uh, modern. They're, they're doing the new things that we know how to do now in the cattle business, that, uh, uh, which uh, has come on just like in everything else. You have to learn how to do it better. And they're certainly keeping right up with it. They have a fine organization. And as we visited there recently, and they're certainly keeping right up with it. They have a fine organization. And as we visited there recently, why I was real pleased uh, at what they're doing. Thank you. They, uh, <coughs> they, I, I am now, uh, I, I now have an operation in Floor County, just this side of Fort Smith on the Arkansas River. It's a farming operation and a cattle feeding operation. I'm still in the cattle business. Uh, I can feed 10,000 cattle there in my lots and farm 1,700 acres of Arkansas River bottom. So I, I still have some activity going <laughs> on. <laughs> and uh, I had that at the same time I had the other ranch, and I needed to cut down on some of my activities. Uh, And Oklahoma's been very good to me. Otherwise, I, I should, uh, I don't, I don't know how a, uh, a kid from Lincoln Town could come to Oklahoma City, 16 years old, and have done, and been treated nicer.